Welcome back to The Social Landlord, where smart investing meets peace of mind. We're still joined by Mo for part two of his interview. Um, Mo, <coughs> I think first thing that we were wanting to go back onto was your, you know, your workflow, your order of work. It's what we were discussing before we left. Um, something you gave me a couple of years back and something that we've sort of developed over the past couple of months just to help our new mentees is a workflow template, um, something just to, and you, you write a lot of yours down and I think seeing it visually and visually being able to see what you've got to do in that day is what helps you tick them off one by yeah, one yeah. rather than just being overwhelmed by, yeah. you know, yeah. a massive page of yeah. 200 jobs to do. Yeah. So we've got a workflow template now that's allocating admin, marketing, you know, all of the aspects of your day-to-day -day job. So we can obviously email that out to anyone that wants it. What would you advise if someone was to try and plot out their day and they don't believe that they could get their day's <clears> worth <throat> of work into one day? Yeah. So obviously you say the power of delegation and things like that, yeah. but some people don't always have things or people to delegate yeah. the jobs to, yeah. what would you advise for someone that thinks they've got 25 hours worth of work and a 24 hour day? I think the key is, is if you can condense, let's say you've got eight hours worth of work and imagine if you could condense that down to three hours and that would free you up for a further five hours. What could you achieve in those further five hours? So for me, the way I look at it is, yes, delegate to other people, um, and if I can understand what is the priorities, get them dealt with, uh, and also going back to my other thought process, which was critical thinking, because I've got to make quick decisions, as you know. We, we make a lot of good, rapid decisions fairly quickly, and then that ho also frees up my time. But I think if you can have a diary and if you can um, uh, map out your day, I think it's very, very important because it's easy to be caught up uh, doing ad hoc stuff and before you know it... You spent an hour yeah, chasing yeah, someone for yeah, a roof yeah, leak. Yeah. And before you know it, you've not achieved what you set out to achieve when you left for work in the morning. So I think, A, it's important to deal with those that are high priority, get them ticked off and, and, and uh, get them completed so at least you don't have to think about it because I've learned the hard way. If you've got something that you're trying to put off or you're trying to delay towards the back of the day, all it's going to do is it's going to bug you for the whole of the day. It's gonna bug you and it's gonna slow you down. So what you're better off doing is just getting it over and done with. And then you realize that wasn't too hard. Uh, I think the other benefit of doing it in the morning is from my experience, you've got time to follow up. Yes. If you chase yeah, something yeah. at 10 o'clock, for example, a contractor or, or I forgot, I'll go in the next couple of hours, you know you've got to call him at one, two o'clock. But if you call him at two, three o'clock, asking him for an update, oh, I don't know, I'll go to more, then he just piles up again for the yeah, next day. It, yeah, that's it. And you know, you know, uh, you deal with one, you know, you deal with one issue, you know there's always 10 more waiting around yes. the corner. So it's never ending. So I think I think the key is, Luis, like you were saying earlier on, is if you've got a diary, you've got a workflow, then you, you're planning your day out. And I think as you get better at this, as the, as the time goes on, you'll you'll be you'll be able to make much more quicker decisions. You're not having to dwell on stuff. You ha you can make rapid decisions, informed decisions. So then what you'll find is those eight days, those eight hours now are condensed to six hours, five hours, four hours. And then if you've got more time left, then that gives you more time to get other stuff done, maybe other business done, uh, or maybe spend a bit more time with the family. So I think. I think it's very, very important, Luis, what you're saying there. And I think if, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think if you've got clients that want to take advantage of that, I think it's a great idea because we're, we're, we're always, we, we, we always have so many things that are vying for our attention, constant on a constant basis. And unfortunately, nowadays, uh, we're, we're tending to find people have short attention spans as well. They not have the ability to th think, think things through as well. So... Uh, and I think part of this is to do with uh, YouTube media. videos and social yeah, media, shorts, I think, yeah, genuinely. Your, th your, your, your analytical skills have been vastly reduced. Uh, your thought process is reduced because your mind is just used to watching 30-second videos, one-minute videos, 
Um, on to the next. Yeah, on to the, the next, next one, right. And you're just constantly being fed information. A lot of it's probably useless. So I think if if you can get in a position where you've got your day mapped out and, and as time goes on, you can make quick, rapid decisions, informed decisions, you leave yourself more time free. You can then spend more time with the family, get more business done. And I think, like I said, we've got five or six businesses that I'm running on a side-by-side -side basis. So I think being able to do that is, is very, very important. So I think if someone has the opportunity to jump on that, Lewis, I think it's very important that they do that, actually. Yeah, so very I don't important. really know how we'd do it being on YouTube because you can't really send a direct message or anything like that. No. Um, but if you just want to reach out to the social media, the Facebook page or the Instagrams, anything like that, whichever page just you send see your the, email over. Whichever we'll page just... you see the video on, just send yeah. a, a message onto that and then we can take you from there, can follow you up. Okay. A question for you, though. Somebody starts a business, within a couple of years they give up. For one reason or other, things have gone against them, the industry is not what it used to be, or they've been promised X, Y, and Z before they started watching these YouTube gurus, and it's not been for them, it's been difficult for them. They eventually either lose relationships because they've been focusing too much and the partner's given up, or the family's just like, you know, spending time where you should be spending time, or they end up losing the business. What's been key to you having that balance with both? Yeah. It can be stressful in both yeah. at times. Yeah. How do you keep focused again? And most importantly, there's only 24 hours in the day. Sure. So everybody needs their own attention. Sure. Everyone, as well as <clears throat> having attention for family, giving attention to business, you still need time to yourself. Yeah, no, no, good. I think the, the, the main thing for me primarily is you've got to focus on the business rather than in the business. So you've got to focus on the growth of the business. You've got to focus on forward thinking and planning ahead. Very, very important. Because it's easy just to get caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff of doing your business. And then before you know it, a week's gone, gone two years gone, time. that's right. And then before you know it, you think, what's happened there? So I think, A, it's always important to detach yourself away and just do an appraisal. Or where am I at so far? Where do I want to go at? How do I get there? And I think it's important that you you, you take that step back rather than just getting caught up in the day-to-day -day stuff on a, on, a, on a daily basis. I think the other thing also is, going back onto your question, Fayaz, is, look, every deal that we appraise, every deal, every property that we're going to buy, not, not all of it fall, uh, 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 follows up and we complete on the stuff that fall by, by the by the wayside. And even, even uh, you know, you've spent an emotional element on that particular deal. You're emotionally attached to it because you spent a lot of time and effort on it. But it may not necessarily be uh, suitable anymore for whatever reason. You know, you may have got some more information on it. So I think it's also important that you don't get emotionally attached to something. Very, very important. Don't get emotionally attached. You have to detach yourself away. Does this deal still work? Um, is it suitable? So, I mean, I'll give you an example. We're looking at one at the moment in Carlisle. And only yesterday, I've spent, I've lost the amount of time and effort that I've spent on this in terms of meetings, phone calls, uh, traveling, and a lot of emotional element attached to it. Because for me, this deal is a step up to what we're doing at the moment. So it, for me, I'm pushing the boundaries again. But only yesterday, I came across something new, which was nutrient neutrality. And, I'm, and, I, and, and I've, I've spoken to the local planners, and they've said, um, unfortunately, there's an issue here with nutrient neutrality. And there's a backlog of uh, housing applications, which is about 2,000 housing applications. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking to myself, I've got everything else agreed on this, and I just wanted the formal conclusion in terms of planning. And this is an issue where it may just fall by the wayside. So I've fairly quickly now got to make a rapid decision. Do I keep spending time and effort on this? Do I keep throwing money at it? Or do I quickly speak to the people that I need to speak to? So for in this case, a planning consultant, and understand, has this development got legs? And... If at the end of it, we exhaust all avenues and we realize that it's got no legs, then I've got to exit from this quickly. Rather than me carrying on being emotionally attached to it and wanting to see it through, 
because of my own stubbornness or my own uh, idiocy. So I think it's also important that, you know, when when you're buying stuff, you you also carry on assessing the deal until its completion because all of a sudden that, that area may have changed or something may have changed on that street and all of a sudden, you know, it might not be the same deal that you signed up to. So I think it's important that you constantly keep reviewing what's going on, not get emotionally attached to it. And if by the time you get to a point where you're coming up to exchange and all of a sudden you realise that it doesn't work anymore, don't be afraid of walking away. Very, very important. Mr. Me and you, Lewis, were speaking briefly about this. Uh, exact same no- conversation. I noticed yesterday. he looked at me as soon as you mentioned it, mm. just the importance of not being emotionally attached to anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like, again, no names mentioned. People trying to force deals to work. I've been brought a deal before. He says, well, this is going to be a four-bedroom house. I says, well, you're missing two bedrooms and a floor. Um, and he was going to move the steps and add a, another... It's just not viable. Work smarter, not harder. There's no need to put 50 grand into a refurb and get the same return. Mm. You may as well put a lesser amount in or the same for a property that's ready to go and go that way, but it was back and forth, and maybe four or five times within the space of a month. I, I, I really think we should do this, really want to do this. Why? He was emotionally attached because he, it was the only deal he had on the board, right, yeah. and he was so focused on forcing that one mm-hmm. to work, rather than just spending that time finding another deal. It's not, yeah. They're not few and far between. There's yeah. hundreds and thousands of them. Don't get hung up on you know, trying you, to move. You can't really think properly when you're emotionally attached because there's just that emotional sentiment where yeah you just become it has to work there is no other mm-hmm. option if you it's, it's four walls there's only so much you can do with it mm. if it's a terrorist property you can't break walls down because yeah. then you're damaging the foundation the structures yeah. so yeah. what what's the importance of just being emotionally no, I, attached? I, I, I think the, the the important thing that we've got to realize as a business is that the lifeblood of any business is new business coming in if you're not getting sales and you're not bringing new business in, then by default, you're going backwards. So to keep on going forwards, you've got to keep generating additional business. So I think in that respects there, it, the important thing is, is make sure you've got a deal flow. Make sure you've got deals happening or properties that you're assessing on a consistent basis so that you're not reliant on that one deal which you're emotionally attached to and which you're, you're going to force through for the wrong reasons. Uh, I think, I think again, you're absolutely correct. If you haven't watched the first half of the episode, again, that lies back to, A, the power of the, power of the follow-up. Yeah. You're not going to get your deals if you're not following up with your agents. Yeah. Um, you said your deal flow. You're not going to have any deals in the pipeline if you just sat there twiddling your thumbs or answering menial emails and just getting caught in the day-to-day, like yeah. you say. It's all a process of <clears throat> discipline, commitment, might say workflow, deal flow, building a pipeline and not being emotionally attached to that one specific property. One more important thing about being emotionally attached, I would say, is leveraging your time per per property. You don't want to spend too much time on something where if it's not going to work for you and you just walk away, spend your time somewhere else, once you start leveraging your time, you feel a bit more better because out of three, four tasks in a day, if you're spending your whole day trying to get this done and it doesn't get done, as far as I'm concerned, you've wasted your time where if you've got three, four other tasks, then big or small they may be, you've yeah. still had a successful day. Yeah. You've got other work done, you've made certain clients maybe disappointed just because the property that guaranteed rent doesn't work for them, but being honest with them, we've closed their case, you're moving on. Uh, but but as far as you go, Mo, one thing that always amazes me about all of you partners is there's a million and one things going on, but we can pick up the phone, ask you about any property, be it just someone that, oh, have we received rent for this, or where's the works for this, or where's the appointment for this, when's this sale coming through, switch from conversation to conversation, mm-hmm. and everything's there. Sure. How is that possible? Like you got so many properties going on. I can ask you about any property and you'll tell me yeah, FIS the rent's coming or yes, FIS we're at this stage of the sale or yes, we're doing this work, so you no, know, I've got social housing coming over on this date. From all the properties in the management to all the sales going through to all the developments to contractors working at properties, how is it sustainable to remember what is happening where, what time 
how we're, what stages we're on. Yeah. I think the important thing is the diary, Lewis, going back on to part one. But I think the other thing is, for me, is, is I actively try to remember when I'm talking to people, I'm having conversations, I actively... Because it's easy just to sit there and let it just go over you. And we've all done it. You know, it comes in one ear, out the other ear, and you want to you wanna listen to what you want to listen to or you want to tell them what you want to tell them. But I think it's important that you actively try to remember what the conversation has been about and, 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 you know, get it stored somewhere in your mind, which is why, I mean, I've said to Lewis on a number of occasions as well, it's important that your memory is very, very important um, in, in relation to that. And that's then going back onto the food you eat as well. So I, for me, for example, I'll have almonds in the morning or walnuts in the morning. At my age, I'm nearly 52, I think memory is, you know, it's diminishing. It's not getting any more better. So I'm going to try to do whatever I can to, to, to assist that. But once again, going back onto what we suggested about uh, keeping fit, uh, what I'm finding is when you are doing activities in the morning prior to coming into work, you've got additional energy. You've got a sharper mind uh, and you're not feeling as tired, to be fair with you, which works, which is quite adverse, really, because you've done some tiring work in the morning, but all of a sudden you've got additional energy. Um, so... I, th I think it just all boils, down, uh, boils back down to that as well. It's actively taking an interest in those conversations with those clients, with those contractors. And once again, it's going back and it's about being genuine with the people that you conduct yourself with on a daily basis. I think that's very, very important. In this shallow world that we live in, like you were saying earlier on, there's a lot of property gurus out there now. I mean, it amazes me on a daily basis, new names that have come up with who all of a sudden have become property Tens of experts. Of yeah. Followers. yeah. Yeah. It's just absolutely amazing. And 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 I and I and I and I look and I think, oh that's another one. That's a new one again today. So, you know, in this in this uh, world where we are, I think when you wanna when you're looking to try to work with an organization, it's important you do your due diligence. Don't just jump at what they tell you at face value. Do your own due diligence. At what they're telling you the truth. Have they got all those years of expertise? Have they done what they've said they've done? Can they prove what they've done? I think a lot of these people are just very privy to social media and how algorithms yeah. work. Yeah. They're not as such <clears throat> professionals in their industry. They're more of a professional in drawing views into a video. Yeah. Yeah. And that gets them a mass of followers and there's always a few sheep in the batch that will yeah. they'll go in that way. Yeah. It doesn't take many people to pay him. Two hundred pound a month on a subscription because he's coaching you, yeah. for him to have a, you know, lavish lifestyle and post sure. all over Instagram, which then in turn brings in more sheep that yeah. just want that, yeah. just want the fancy gold gold stakes yeah. and, you know, your bottles yeah. of Don Perry on. They don't yeah. want to put that work yeah. in beforehand. Yeah. I, so yeah. if if your guru mentor is got more pictures of a Lamborghini on there than he has work boots and. Whatever yeah. else, the chances are yeah. you're probably yeah. following the wrong yeah. person. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think we, we've we been, like I was saying earlier on, we've been involved in property for many years and there's a lot of hard work that you've got to do to lay the foundation and you've got to carry on following that through. And uh, in this fickle, shallow world, unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that are so-called experts, but it's important that you validate them and, and it's important that you just don't jump on what they're telling you, make sure you do, do, do your due diligence on them, make sure they've done what they've said they've done, uh, and then test them. But for example, with ourselves, like I said, we've got um, uh, uh, over 400 properties that are on management, that are on social leases. We've been involved in the social housing uh, sector since 2014, 2015. And we've got properties that we've looked after which have... Uh, run through the, the, the first part of the lease process and we've renewed it again and on one occasion I think we're, it's, we're in the third stage of renewal now so it's important that like I said you you uh, validate the organisation that you're working with um, and, and just make sure that they're approaching you for the right reason they're not interested in just taking your money out of your pocket uh, but they want to make sure that you are a success and that that see it through. But understand, it's not a 12 months thing here. It's not a, even a couple of years thing. 
property is a long game. And as long as you understand that um, and, and understand the people that you're working with and it's for the right reason, then that will make you, hopefully that will make you a success in terms of what you're doing. You mentioned uh, you were doing social housing and you're in the third batch of the leases mm. being renewed. How do you stay aligned with keeping ahead of the curve but at the same time not lo- not at the same time not losing a relationship not losing what's given at current yeah i mean to be fair i i, I get uh, landlords that uh i speak to still who only knew, were aware of us when they handed their terrace property over and they've seen our journey but i find a lot of satisfaction because these people will ring me and they'll say i know you're really busy but can you help us with this or where are you at with this? And for me, not to ignore the phone call or not to think, well, you know what, you're not important anymore in my life because I've got other bigger and better things. So no, we don't go down that route. For me, everyone's important. And I think it's just valuing those relationships because it's those people in the early days that have got you to where you are now. Correct. Even those uh, uh, um, 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 estate agents, for example, that we work with, <laughs> they've all helped us in terms of where we're at now so don't forget your roots don't forget where you've come from make sure you've always got one eye on that even though you're on a uh, you know you're, you're on an upward trajectory and, and you're doing large multi-million pound deals so i think it's just important uh, fires that you just uh, remember those people that were there for you in the early stages and just you know make sure that you don't forget you know uh, uh, what they've done for you back then how do you say ahead of the curve? Like, well, I think once again, it's 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 just not being complacent. I think it's easy just to be complacent. Because what we in the last two three months, I've had phone calls from our landlord saying, "Oh, there's a lot of money, or there's a lot of financial benefits in doing these developments and buying these blocks and renovating them, putting them on long term leases, and then selling them." I said, "I, I said, can I tell you something? This is something that started off about two years ago." You see a lot of people advertising it now. Yeah. So yeah. now it's coming to light. Whenever you go on LinkedIn, whenever you go on social media, there's, I'm doing X, Y, and Z, and I need blocks and vacant possession. I need it six to 12 in apartments. I need all sub meters mm. separate. I need them 40 square meters. Like everybody's, and I mean mm. everybody. Just copy and paste the email. I know. Sent, you know it's they're, the all, same, they're all sharing it's the, the same, same spec thing. requirement. It's like, oh, well, I'm, sure, I'm sure the first one, you guys it was in Stockton about two years ago since then you've done another two now you're on a couple more in the pipeline right we started this long time ago I I just I I know how you stumble across that as well but generally you are being ahead of the curve yeah would you see anything changing going forward no I think I think the Stockton one we did about three just over three years ago um, and since then we've done quite a lot more Um, but but I think it's just valuing those relationships uh, with people and just being genuinely open and honest um we've we've um and, and just keep pushing the boundaries i think like i said is for us is just keep pushing the boundaries uh, if you're pushing the boundaries then you're growing otherwise you know from my perspective you're just going backwards uh, really um uh, but yeah unfortunately there's a lot of people now coming on board that want to be involved in social housing Social social housing is still an asset class which is in its growth stages. So I remember back in the early mid two thousands when we had purpose built purpose built student accommodation. So that once again was at the early stages, and now it's deemed as a a, a mature asset class. So social housing fairly shortly, I also think, will be deemed as a a, a mature. Uh, social asset class um, but for us I think we also I also look at the genuine difference that we make to people's lives I think the genuine difference that this, the social impact that we're having on those vulnerable people in societies and how we're helping them as you're aware the council don't accommodate this kind of thing it's the private sector that comes in uh, uh, to put these out to various organisations but once again, I, I think it's important that you you look at the difference that you're making to people's lives, and, and that gives me some satisfaction as well. So I think there's a lot of people out there on social media, like you said, who thinks it's, all of a sudden they make it look quite easy. 
that all you've got to do is just get a block and do a refurbishment and that's it, you're we, done. We know how hard it is to yeah. just to find a block that's yeah. vacant, never mind anything else. Yeah. That's yeah. your biggest hurdle. Yeah. You know how hard yeah. it is. It's not. Yeah. It's not as easy as they make it sound. No, no, no. Then ah. the next part is making sure all the yeah. properties done up to the yeah. specifications yeah. that needs to be done. At you yeah. need experienced people yeah. around you. Yeah. Well, that was just uh, before you even started that conversation. I was just going to say that I think because of the growth, like we were talking with Murray last month, um, social housing is a bit of a buzzword now. Mm. I could go on Facebook, I could put you 100 agents that claim to be a social housing, yeah, yeah. you know, specialist managing agent or whatever else. I think that social housing sector of brokers and agents is going to become very heavily regulated in the next 12 months or so. Okay. Um, so I think the fact that you've had 15 plus years worth of mm. experience in mm. that sector mm. means you should be substantial enough to weather yeah. that storm yeah. and come out as one of the you know, the main yeah. main suppliers, yeah. as we should have been anyway, I imagine. Yeah. Um but yeah, I think it is gonna shake out a lot of the the Facebook gurus yeah. and, and Instagram yeah. mentors and, yeah. and things like to, that. Yeah, I think the a lot of these people are thinking for the short term. The moment yeah. something else comes up, they'll yeah, be they'll jumping on that. Yeah. Yeah. On yeah. that Again, one. short attention <clears throat> spawn. Yeah. Just yeah. on it for the quick cash. Yeah. And then. I think I think for us also as a, an organization we're constantly reviewing what we're doing. We're looking at what are our weaknesses? What are our shortcomings? How can we improve what we're doing? How can we give a better experience to our clients? And I think as long as you've got that mindset of wanting to constantly improve and wanting to give a better experience to those that work with you, I think that also puts us in good stead. But I think also for us, it's about being ethical. It's about doing it for the right reasons, uh, and 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 letting people know that we're here to stay, we're not we're not going anywhere quickly. We're here to stay. We've got long term projections as an organisation. Um, for those investors that work with us, we're probably buying on average uh, ten to twelve properties a month that we buy and add value to, and refurbish and and put on leases. So, I think as long as people understand that we're here for the long time, for the long term, um, and we're here to make sure that we look after their best interest, then that will give us a solid foundation for success. We will still be here in five years' time, I'd like to think. We've still got long-term plans. We're nowhere near what we want to achieve, so therefore we will constantly keep pushing the boundaries. And as an organisation, we would like to think we are one of the market leaders in terms of our thought process, our forward planning element of it as well. And I also like to think that those that work with us will grow with us as well, and they will benefit from um, um, uh, they will benefit from our growth, uh, uh, and that way uh, uh, it will give us a solid foundation uh, of which to expand with as well. So we'll end it on a positive note because we're already twenty two minutes over schedule. Wow. Um, Wherever you're watching your podcasts, please don't forget to like and subscribe.